Right. Well, I am super, super excited uh, to welcome our dear friends and close colleagues, uh, James Robertson and Phil Sterling from the Summit Group, uh, based in America. Um, so, James and Philip, welcome to the Sales Transformation Podcast. Thank you, Dr. Squire. The great reunion has finally happened. Thank you for making it happen. Thank yeah. you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, no, it really, I, I'm so excited about this because, um, yeah, just for the benefit of our listeners, um, the relationship with with Phil and James and the Summit Group go way back. Uh, we were, in fact, brought together by a mutual client that we had, Compact Computers, all those years uh -huh. ago. <laughs> you didn't think I'd be going back that far, Phil, I don't think. <laughs> good, good recollection, my friend. Yeah, no, it goes back a, an awfully long way. And we, we've both been on um, sort of incredible journeys. Um, James and Philip, you know, clearly you know, operating out of the States and, and us in Europe. And we've done multiple projects together over the years, and they've all been absolutely fabulous fun. Um, but the reason why we're together for this podcast is to talk about uh, the incredible journey that James and Philip have been on um, with, with their doctorate and their research. I think as many of the listeners will know, there are not that many people who've done a, a doctorate in sales in our profession. Um, they've come to this at a certain stage in their lives, um, qualifying, I think it was last year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's it, and, and, and the purpose of the Sales Transformation podcast is to ask James and Philip to kind of share the journey that they went on, you know, during the, the doctorate uh, to talk about their findings and to, and, and to share their insights about how they see the future of sales. Um, so, so broadly speaking, and before I sort of go into direct questions, the way we'd like to structure the, this particular podcast is to focus on three um, three, if you like, strands. One is around hindsight, sort of getting Phil and James to share their incredibly long um, pedigree, I'd say, in sales through their sales careers, but also um, to give them a chance to talk about their reflections of the sales industry in, in, in general. The kind of insights that they've had as a consequence of the research journey that they've embarked on and what sort of insights um, they developed during the doctorate and um, foresights in the sense of actually looking at the future and the future of sales. So broadly speaking, uh, these are the three areas that we're going to talk about. But before we go into the nuts and bolts of the uh, research that they've done, um, I would love for Phil uh, then James, maybe to just give a quick potted history about who you are, where you've come from, a little bit of your sort of career in sales uh, before we get started into the doctorate itself. So, Phil, can I ask you just to introduce yourself? I would rather defer to my better half, Dr. James Robertson, to open it up. And okay. James, you begin, then I will introduce myself, but I'd love to go have you go first, my friend. Great. So, so F F Phil Squire, because we've got two Phils on the call. Thank you for the, thank you for the privilege of your time and for this opportunity to collaborate. Uh, you know, the genesis of us being here is you. Uh, I think you've been an inspiration to a lot of people, and I think you were the incentive oh. or the motivation for us to start the the doctrine in the in the first place. So I don't know whether to thank you or curse you because it was, <laughs> it was quite a journey. But, I'm but sure you did both. <laughs> Thank you. So, so a little bit, James Robertson. Um, you know, sales, marketing, account management's in my blood. I was part of the the doctoral journey is reflection, and I look back and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? And and I look back to my father. He was a marketing director for Unilever in in Africa, and figuring out how to sell soap and healthcare beauty products to in 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 that part of the world. Um, 
and 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 as I look at that, that's sort of what I've continued to do. I've worked now in four and lived uh, in four continents, and um, and always in in this realm of sales and marketing. So um, just a, a privilege to be here. Over the last fifteen years, I've had the honor of working with Phil Sterling. And there's a little bit of a story about how that came about. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the beauty of that being has been that we we get to work with clients across industries across the planet, and and we see these patterns of of excellence and and areas where companies and people are really struggling. And I think it's that fascination with how our organisations going to work and perform in the future that really motivates me and motivated me to start the doctorate in the first place. Thank you, James. Thank you. That's brilliant. Phil, can I hand over to you? Two things. Phil, I want to just put a punctuation mark on your opening comments about our relationships. And I hope, if anything, this podcast can serve as a as a verbal billboard for why deep relationships matter in life. Mm-hmm. Three of us have been together longer than I can remember, at least 20 years, both as first as deep friends, mm-hmm. second business partners. And as I look back on life, as I get older, relationships aren't an accessory to life. They are central to life. Mm-hmm. And so the two men I'm looking at on the, on this screen as this podcast, um, these are the relationships here matter so deeply. And if there's one message for anybody listening, if you want to have a rich and fulfilling life, focus on relationships. And I hope that anyone listening is blessed to have the kind of friends that I have in Phil Squire mm-hmm. and James Robertson. So I just want to put that on the table. Um, now, myself, um, was in corporate for 24 years in sales, uh, then left corporate and providentially was able to buy the Summit Group. Little did I know that it would be the container for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Little did I know that it would be the catalyst to meet the great friend and business partner of James Robertson, what Mm -hmm. I call providential partner of my life. And so it's funny how business works, isn't it? But I think for all of us, there's very little separation between our business life and our personal life, because Mm -hmm. this is our life's work. I don't know when I'm working and I don't know when I'm not. Uh, I don't think I'll ever retire because this is just my life. Sales is my life. And I, and I was thinking in preparation for this, why am I so preoccupied? And of, of all of the things, why did I choose selling? And James, I don't know if I'm speaking for you or not, I, I'll, probably somewhat. Winston Churchill once said, business is the horse that pulls the social cart. Mm-hmm. And I believe sales is the fuel that fuels the horse. And so I've always believed, and my father taught me, if you want to help the poor, sell something, (laughs) get a job, create profit, because capitalism is the greatest way to help humankind, and sales is the oxygen of it. So to me, sales is not about the numbers. It's about the higher order value that it brings to life and the economy and society, if that makes sense. That's it, why. Well, it makes so much sense, and you know it's it, it's interesting, and I think it's uh, as you I think you know one of the one of the areas that is that has drawn my interest has been you know the traditional silk routes of many yeah. hundreds and thousands of years ago, and one of the things that's interesting when you follow the silk route and you start to visit some of the great trade hubs that are on the Silk Route, whether it's Persepolis or Palmyra, or whether it's the City of Kings in in Sicily, you begin to see the connection between trade and culture, and trade and health, and trade and music. Uh, And this is replicated not just with the with the land-based silk routes, but the great uh, maritime silk routes of Cheng He in the 1400s. Right. And, and it's quite interesting that, uh, and, and I know that we share the same passion, you know, for sales, and we see its link almost as a precursor, you know, without trade, you know, some of the, the, the these things 
that we talk about in terms of culture and music and diversity, so many of these, these things wouldn't happen. Yet sales for many, many years has not been recognized, I think, as the the precursor to much of what we really appreciate in life outside of trading, per se. Sales has always had a slightly, uh, particularly in Europe, maybe not so much in America, <laughs> but slightly tarnished image. And I, I think that, I think what you've been doing with the Summit Group and what we've been doing at Consalia has sort of shared a common vision for the passion we have about sales and, and, and the reason why we, like you say, it's sort of become a life's work. I think that's a very good way of putting it. I want to build on what James said about you too, Phil. I remember when we first met, one of the great gifts you gave me and to us is to put words to what we were thinking. And uh, words like, and I'm gonna use your words now, the nobilization of selling, mm -hmm. the profession of selling, to make selling the world's most sought after profession. I've, I, I had those feelings, but I didn't have the words to express them. And you brought the words that made wow. sense to me and to others. And for that, we thank you. Oh. Well, that's great. Well, um, thank you, um, Phil and James, for the wonderful introductions you've both made. Um, so I just want, before again, before we go into the detail of your research, I just want the listeners to understand the role that the Summit Group play in the uh, professionalization of sales in the USA, but you know, particularly, I know you're global and I know you work with a lot of US companies all over the world, all over the planet, as you said earlier. But actually, you do play a very important role in one of the most important institutions in sales in America, which is the Summit Group. And I think that, you know, the, the, the Summit Group for the listeners are thought leaders alongside a number of other organizations as well, but they're definitely you know, regarded in America as the thought leaders. And within that community, Phil and James are probably the only people who've gone on and done a doctorate. Am I right in saying that? <laughs> I I don't know, to be honest with you. I uh... bet you I'm right. I <laughs> bet you I'm right on that one. So <laughs> let me know if I'm wrong. I'm sure we can correct. There you go. <laughs> we can correct it. But so what I'm trying to say is, is it, it is you know you've got a point of view about sales which is really worth listening to and i think it's it's very much encapsulated in the research in the doctorate that you both have done so um let's move on to the doctorate and um a, a, and what i'd like to explore here perhaps in the first instance is is what what drew you to doing a doctorate in the first instance? Because it's a hell of a commitment to make. You're both incredibly busy people. So so what was the draw? What was the reason for you both doing it? I don't know who to direct it to, whether it's James or Phil. I don't well, mind. I'll start with James, the adult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Phil, for the, for the question. So what inspired us to start the doctorate? I think firstly it was you, by the way, again. Sorry to give you all the credit, but, oh, you know, oh. You, you've paved the way for pro professionalizing sales and doing your doctorate. And I think where the Consalia and the Summit Group often come together is based on some of the research that you did around sales mindsets and and the behaviors that really are going to distinguish salespeople. So I'd say for sure we we give you credit for where we started. The other one is Phil. And, and you know, Phil cares to share. There's a deeper reason why Phil wanted to do the, the doctorate. Um, and Phil and I have worked really closely together over the last, we first met in a conference room in South Sweden in 2003, and we've worked really closely since then. So I think back to people and relationships, uh, a lot of the reason we started was was the two of you in on this podcast. I think the other thing is I've just got a fascination for the future. You know, what is the future going to look like and how are we going to thrive and survive in that world and and you know in order to do that i know we have to keep learning i've always loved learning mm. um and i think if you look back over the last 20 years we've been running so fast we haven't had the time to step back and say what have we actually done and and learned and and what does that mean for the future so i think that was the real gift that the doctorate gave gave us we had a 
professor who was holding our hand through the journey, uh, Professor Brian Sutton, give him tremendous credit as along with Middlesex uh, University. But um, it gave us the opportunity to step back and reflect and say, you know, where, where is the world now and where are we headed? And, you know, we all feel and know there's just a tremendous amount of change going on. So I think that that was really the the impetus yeah. is uh, look back, but look back in order to look forward. I found that as I get older and I look at people who are not just successful, but are significant in their life have taken time to make sense of their life. And mm -hmm. to James's point, what we wanted to do is take a structural retrospective of what brought us here. In both in life and career, what brought us here? You live life forward, but you understand it backwards. But we wanted to take time to understand it backwards and the doctorate was the framework uh, to do that. Secondly, I personally wanted to also upgrade my intellectual operating system. I just wanted to learn how to think at a higher level, not just for business, but for life. And I knew, Phil, based on your guidance, that that was a big part of the discipline and rigor of the doctorate. Now, candidly, it's harder than I ever thought it was. In fact, in hindsight, if I knew it was going to be that hard, we probably wouldn't have done it. I hate to say it, but it's just true. It was far more difficult than I ever anticipated but far valuable than I could ever have imagined. Can I ask, I think, Phil? What, what? Please. When you said it was far more difficult, I mean, what, what, what was the difficult bit for it? What, what did you find challenging? Well, I'll just speak personally. Um, I'm a big picture guy. I'm not a writer, and so just the act of writing was difficult. However, I've understood why writing matters. Because it, if you can't write something, you haven't thought well enough. But it was painful. Mm. But it was valuable. And number two was just the sheer rigor of it. It's it's easy to write, you know, something long, but it's hard to it's easy to addify. It's hard to stratify. And you know, and and Brian Sutton, as I call him, the the doctorate with skin, because this man was the wise counsel, the wise Sherpa. He was our living doctorate. Mm. And he forced us to clarify our thinking. That's hard, but again, it's valuable. So, um, and then finally, I think, so number one, a retrospective, number two, to upgrade my intellectual operating system. And third is to leave an artifact for the future, a roadmap yeah. for our firm, the summit group, and a roadmap for the industry that has given so much to both myself and James. Yeah. James, I don't know if you want to add any more to what Phil has well, said there. Why Why was it challenging? Yeah, um, yeah. so, so it think, was a challenge because I, I think also yeah. you had two of you doing it. You know, that, that must have been a bit of a challenge. You know, you're both coming at it from perhaps slightly different angles, but was yes. it the written work for you? Or I, I think the, the, the two main, just to build on what F Phil said, the two main challenges, number one, it challenged a lot of our assumptions. Yeah. You know, yeah. we 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 read more broadly and deeply than I think I've read for a long time yeah. uh, about things that we didn't really know or understand. And how do you integrate that and that sort of a transdisciplinary thinking in a way? How do you integrate some of these ideas into what we're doing? And as we talk a little in a, in a short while, yeah. we'll share with you some of the things that came to us that we we had no yeah. idea we were going to uncover. Yeah. So I think there was a lot of challenging uh, assumptions, and I think the other one is. You know, clients uh, engage us because we're practical. You know, we we can take ideas and concepts and we can help them apply and, and implement them in their world. And I think the what what in a way was a little bit of a conflict initially was between sort of an academic uh, approach to building a doctorate and, and a yeah. pragmatic practitioner approach that yeah. we take. And 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 yet at the outcome, it's the fusion of those two that really built. I think our learning and insights in the doctorate. But initially, I'm afraid the practical side of us and the academic side of us were a little bit uh, one up against the other. Yeah. No, I 100% um, relate to that. I, I think sales is, is very much a sort of verbal expression, isn't it? We're taught how to, you know, ask questions, to present. Uh, the written word is something that is not given that much focus. So I, I completely get about the 
you know, the act of writing is important, but um, Phil, as you were saying as well, you know, the, and I felt the same, it's being able to uh, condense your thinking into something quite succinct to the point, well-referenced, well-researched is actually quite a challenge. Mm. Um, but James, to your point about reflection is that, and you may like to talk more about this, what, what I found as being one of the great benefits of, of doing the, the research doctorate is you come into it with a certain frame of reference because that's obviously based on your experience, the context of the world in which you've lived, your points of view. And you go through a period, I certainly did, where you suddenly are wanting or having to let go perhaps of some of the preconceptions, the ideas that you've actually had. And that that's quite hard to begin with when you're beginning to challenge and question and with people like Brian Sutton that's sort of <laughs> challenging you, I'm, I'm quite sure. But, you know, when you start to sort of move out of that sort of, I call it the the valley of despair, you know, the valley, <laughs> when you move <laughs> out of that, it's just incredibly empowering to to sort of suddenly see the world in a different way. And it gives you that sort of layer of of knowledge and appreciation of wisdom, I think, as well, because you've gone through that that sort of pain barrier. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you both of you went through a little bit of that as well when you were in the midst of doing it. And Phil, to your point, you know, as I use this metaphor of upgrading your intellectual operating system, yeah, at, at least for me. The three thought platforms that influenced me was number one, reflective practice. Yeah. Which in quick summary is attack your assumptions. Yeah. The second was appreciative inquiry, which in yeah. quick summary is build on what's working. And third yeah. is Bayesian thinking, which is constantly update your decision making based on new facts. Yeah. yeah. And those three, call them thought platforms, inserted in to my brain have helped me see life and business differently. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to ask one more question about the experience of doing the doctorate before we go into the detail of of your particular findings. Is that you know sales is such a fast paced environment. It's you know when we look at the people that we're working with. You know, they barely have time to breathe, let alone think. Yet you have, through this process, gone through an incredible level of deep thinking, you know, about what it is you're doing. Like you said, sort of questioning your assumptions and and so on. Um, given the academic nature of the doctorate, is it something that you would recommend other people to do in sales or do you think it's something just for the the few minority that are stupid enough maybe not the right phrase crazy enough you know to to do it i mean what do you think if if i comment i think there's a lot of life is about paradoxes and managing the paradoxes so phil as you said and we see that with all of our clients they're running faster their world is more complex um, and, and as a result, you don't have time to really think and reflect. And yet the yeah. doctor presents that opportunity. So yeah. how do you how do you manage that paradox? And and I think the the key takeaway from us is that you have to be able to do that um, in order to really reflect on what you've done to guide you where you're going to go in the future. Yeah. Um, I, I wish I'd done it a little bit earlier in maybe in my career. I think I would have been thinking differently instead of running faster for the last yeah. 20 years. Phil, I'm going to steal your language when you say sales is a thinking game. Yeah. And so it is important to rigorously upgrade your thinking because that is the future of selling is how you think. And so one of the challenges I have for all listeners is to, to, to look at yourself and say, how can I create my own proprietary thought model, kind mm. of my intellectual signature that I bring both, again, to life and business? Because one of the takeaways that I 
brought from the doctorate is the soft stuff is now the hard stuff and the hard stuff is going to AI. It's the human factors that are mm -hmm. going to define us and the future of the industry. So yeah. yes, I think bringing rigor to your thought has never mattered more. Yeah. Yeah, no, I hundred percent agree, and uh, and at a sort of lower level, yeah, not not a lesser level, but nonetheless still really impactful, is that um, we're seeing that those going through the master's programs, you know, going through a a similar exercise of reflection, but not, you know, obviously it's not a three or four year, you know, research project they're doing, but. It's the reason why I think we're beginning to see this fusion. You mentioned it earlier, Phil, the fusion between sort of the academic and the business, or was it James? I can't remember now. The fusion between those two disciplines coming together is just, you know, just fantastic, isn't it? You know, the rigor that you get from the academic side and how you think applied to the practical nature of how we do business is just a fantastic combination. And I'm, you know, pretty surprised that, that we don't do more of that. <laughs> right. Agree. And but by the way, on. there's also yeah. a reward to it. I, I, One of the reasons that, again, I chose to do it is I wanted to do something hard later in life. Yeah. I'm very honest with you. Um, in hindsight, I'm surprised you actually got through it, but it felt very, very good to accomplish. I'm not going to deny that. Yeah. Especially later in life, it helps your confidence and your competence. Yeah, not about that. And the wonderful thing as well, I mean, I joke about it when it comes to sort of reflecting on on my doctorate that that my doctorate took four years to do, I think, slightly longer than yours, and at the end of it, I came out with four things. Mm. <laughs> you know, four things is, oh my goodness, maybe six, maybe eight, if you want to look at, uh, you know, the four positive mindsets and the four negative. That was that was the sum conclusion of four years of work. <laughs> but actually the journey to getting there is, is, was just incredible. But the fact is that you can focus in on something that you really care about. This is what the doctorate does. You know, you really care about and out of it, you you distill from that the essence of something that goes into your thinking for the future. I, I, I you know, it's it's an incredible, it's incredibly empowering, um, and uh, enriching process. So, let's now focus on you and the topic of your um, your doctorate. So I don't know, again, whether James or Phil want to kind of talk about, you know, what was your concern? What was your inquiry? What was the problem that you were trying to solve, you know, with your research into, uh, into sales? I think what it started was, with was looking at where sales is today um, and and reflecting on the dynamics. So we mapped, and again, building on a lot of what you've done, uh, Phil, and and what is in some of the uh, the writings around the world and trends was we called them errors of selling. And what we observed when we mapped the errors of selling against a number of key criteria, we've seen a, a complete shift in in the di direction. Uh, of these influences or powers. Um, so maybe that doesn't reveal anything substantial, but it, it said to us that the world is changing, will continue to change, and the way that the world that the sales professional is operating in has, has and will continue to fundamentally shift. We didn't know the answer as to where that's going to be or, or what are going to be the capabilities that are going to enable us to be successful in the future. But I think part of the doctorate was it was a journey and we were in, interested to try and figure out what is that going to look like? I don't know that we've come to all the answers, but the but the fun is I think we've uncovered um, some quite interesting dimensions that we think are going to enable how sales organizations, how sales professionals really do thrive and survive and perform in, in the future. I think what we did unearth Phil, on that journey that James is referencing is number one, the 
back to the eras of selling. Yeah. That one of the things we can say for sure is that the ideology that underpins the profession of selling has fundamentally shifted from in the past, it has been based on the art of persuasion, which is what I call a push ideology. Yeah. Today in the future, it's based on exactly the opposite, an alignment ethos, which is a pull ideology. And nothing could be more pronounced than that. There's been a fundamental shift in the polarity of the thinking and ideology that underpins selling. And I think that's both exciting and that also represents this great big shift in the era that James has referenced. That is, to me, the biggest takeaway that we yeah. believe in and also validated. I think the second one is that these human factors, which I referenced earlier, and we focused in on two areas of character and mindset, are two kind of core human factor pillars that inform this new role of strategic sales and the thinking that's going to be required for the future. And I think it can be codified in, in a single sentence that came from Dr. Fred Keel. Who you are will matter more than what you do. Because AI will always be able to do more than us yeah. as far as the functionality. But now it's our character and how we think and how we show up to others. That will be the ultimate distinguisher. I think that was probably the second biggest takeaway. Yeah. And I think the third one is this. Relationships will matter more than ever. Yeah. Uh, we started yeah. out this discussion about relationships but they're going to matter more than ever in a world where AI will take over, but you can't be in a relationship with a machine. So can I come back to the comment you made about the eras and you think that there's a new belief, and I think we share similar views that, you know, the nature of selling is fundamentally shifted, you know, and you talk about it shifting from a push much more to a, a pull. Um, yet, and whilst you were going through this sort of thinking about the different eras and looking at how most sales organizations think that they need to go about their sales approach. So sort of relating your observations of the eras and then looking at the way in which organizations out there were implementing selling strategies Um you know, what did that connection between what you saw in practice sort of mapping against the eras? What, what, what went, you know, what, what have you noticed? Mm. What have you observed? I don't think I've asked this question very clearly, but hopefully you can make some sort of sense of it. I think that the thing that we observe every day in our own lives, by the way, but also the lives and uh, organizations of our client is, is they're trying to do more with less. They're running fast, so they don't have the time to, as you were saying earlier, Phil, to yeah. step back and reflect and, and think. So I think what we observe is you you have, it's almost a, a fork in the road. If you're a sales leader uh, uh, um, in the sales profession, you can run faster and try to do more and be more efficient. Mm. I think we still see that's the bulk of organizations. We're trying to, how do we actually get better at what we already do? Yeah. And I think one of the key things we came across on our doctoral journey is work from uh, Bob Keegan, Nick Petrie, Torbett around what's known as vertical development. Uh, the best analogy for that comes from Petrie, in our opinion, is sales organizations are trying to do more faster by putting more knowledge and process and capability and, and skills into a container that is a glass or a container that has one size. And, and that just means we're overloaded. I think that's one of the ramifications in terms of mental health that we're seeing mm -hmm. in the industries, people just trying to, to run faster and do more with less. The, the other fork in the road is say, yes, we need to be efficient, but and we need to be able to build capacity to do more and operate more effectively in a world that's going to continue to get, get more complex. So I think the journey or the path we went on and this is what we're starting to integrate into, into our practice and work with clients is how do you not only continue to get more effective and efficient at what you do, but but how do you build the, the capacity to do that without burning yourself out? 
And it's like this coffee cup, Phil, we're finding many organizations just want to pour more into the cup. Yeah. But the James's point, as human beings, we can only, we only have the capacity for yeah. so much. And a lot of mental health is we're spilling over. With What we found is the key now is to, to build a bigger cup, to expand capacity. Yeah. Now, we don't see many organizations thinking like that yet, to be honest with you. I'd love to tell you that we see, you know, enlightenment in many yeah. organizations. It's still in the minority. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a really interesting one because, you know, you, you both have been on this incredible journey and you completely get the notion of capacity. You know, you've studied it and you have got, and I'm sure we'll come on to this a bit later on, what do you think of the critical components of what may build capacity? Uh, you've you've mentioned one of them already with reflective practice, perhaps. But mm. but um, so I think that this this notion, the language that you're speaking, is is very different to the language that sales directors potentially are speaking. You know, who are in this world of quarterly driven results, performance um you know burnout because of the huge pressures they're under um and you know it's it's uh it takes a particular type of client to suddenly start to look at sales performance through a a different lens i, I don't know if, if you would agree with that or not but that's certainly how we're we're seeing things uh, you know ourselves with with our clients Absolutely. I think this kind of development takes a long, a longer term view. And if you're really focused on short term targets, it's very difficult. Again, another paradox. Yeah. How do we manage the yeah. long term and the short term? So I think what we're yeah. seeing, some organizations are starting to invest in the long term. And that's about the fundamentals of reflective practice, mindset, uh, character, who we are yeah. back to, to Dr. Fred yeah. King. So can I just um, so just on the the just to maybe finish off on the hindsight uh, hindsight's kind of piece. So as you were doing the doctorate, am I right in saying that you began to question the fundamental principles that many companies have adopted, perhaps yourselves as well, about what it takes to you know create sales performance in the era in which we're operating today. You know, that's that's part of your the journey that you took. You began to question, are we doing the right things and are your clients doing the right things? Sorry, James. A a absolutely. I think if Phil, if I, I feel certain if I look at our work over the last 15 years or so, and it's a little bit how my brain works, it's been been very architecturally process knowledge, skills, competence, focuses, yeah. sort of this linear process development. And and I think we've yeah. got quite good at that. Our relationship with the Strategic Account Management Association, we're on the faculty, yeah. on the board. It's It's been a lot of, you know, how do we get better? How do we have more knowledge yeah. and, and competence? We've not, we've been ignorant. I'm talking for myself, but maybe for some other people, we've been ignorant that there are other ways to learn um yeah. tapping into some of the thought leaders that are really thinking about ad adult learning and and development and and that kind of uh, vertical development takes time so organizations yeah. don't have the the patience yeah. for that yeah okay that's great I'd, I'd love to ask you your point of view also because i, I think if, we, if you're looking you know within the time we've been working together we've seen this phenomenal um surge in 2011 to maybe 2000 and i don't know 18 maybe 20 of the challenger sale and the kind of principles that that was espousing and so many organizations were talking about well the challenger sale is is the route to market to go and you know clearly they've had a huge amount of success on the back of that which is this teach tailor take control kind of approach do you have a point of view about that kind of methodology in the era in which organizations are functioning together? Does it have a role to play? Or do you think that's part of this push analogy that you're you know, referring to? Is, is, is that sort of fueling the push approach, which you think is fundamentally different? You've gone quiet for that question. James, your thoughts? Or would you like me to take a... Will you take it? 
Phil, I think uh, the challenger ideology has some positive elements, but I yeah. still think it's a lot of push ideology with a coat of paint. And I'm going to use again, Phil Square, your language of the difference between tactful audacity and arrogance. Yeah. Because part of this new ethos of alignment and pull is that listening is the new solving. Mm. And part of one of the new acumens is professional noticing yeah. and structured listening. Then after you've listened, then is to be, as you would say, tactfully provocative and provide some relevant insights. But I think it's very, very careful how you manage that, that balance. I agree. I, you know, 100% agree. And I've been slightly provocative, I suppose, in asking such a direct question at this stage. But, uh, and I agree with you, um, you know, that, that, that um, a lot of the principles behind the challenger sale, I think, were commendable and interesting and quite creative. In the, but I think that potentially in the wrong hands or, or with insufficient context of what, are the core principles about that particular approach, you could end up actually creating a completely wrong impression, you know, with clients. And I, I you say, know, so, so, so I think it, it's got a lot and it, it did a lot, I think, for the sales profession. If we're looking back at the last, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I think it's done a lot to elevate the kind of uh, a new way of thinking about sales but I think what you're questioning, what we're questioning is given, you know, the future and the way we see the markets going, is that approach perhaps, does it have a place? Yeah, you know, question. So a lot of this goes back to your research, what we now yeah. call the famous London School of Research, <laughs> our customers seek. And if I recall, Phil, one of the things you found that customers didn't seek was arrogance. It Correct. Yeah. And I, and a framing metaphor is that I think strategic selling in the future is a business, a form of business therapy. Yeah. And what great therapists do first is listen. Yeah. Deeply, intently, and structurally before they provide counsel. Yeah. And it's interesting what you say about relationships, which you focused on so much, because I think in in some of the research that came out of that book they talked about that the role of the relationship manager was 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 slightly diminished in view of what's uh, important to in terms of being a or creating a source of competitive advantage but um we'll we'll come back to that point perhaps a, a little bit later on but i think it's important i think both yourselves and us believe that there has been a, a fundamental shift in the way that we need to think about sales and that we are now operating in very much a different era and and a new a new language needs to be created and i think you're helping to build on that with the outputs of your your doctorate which i i think is amazing okay so, so i just yeah. want to put a bow on one of your thoughts there we, you talked about sales leadership for just a moment what we see is the of the distinguishing sales leaders is they're focusing on their people first because they're realizing that talent is what drives financial outcomes. And never in all the 40 some years I've been in the profession of selling, have I seen such a stark correlation between talent and the numbers. No okay. talent, no financial outcome. It's just, yeah. it's never been more obvious. Yeah, Your culture is the engine. Yeah. And if you don't have the right talent, the numbers won't be there. So uh, back to great sales leaders, focus on your people as your customer. Fantastic. Okay. So um, can we move on to insights now? And you've begun to talk about character and mindsets and, and so on. And you mentioned the work of our great friend, your great friend. I introduced to him, uh, Dr. Fred Keel, um, and his concepts around return on character, which I think has played such a big role in, in your thinking 
also about sales. So what do we mean by character? I guess that's the first question. What do we mean by character? Well, I think, first of all, let's place it in context of what James mentioned earlier. One of our great findings is the need for more vertical development. So let's just frame that for 30 seconds. Okay. But horizontal development is building your breadth. It's building your acumen, which matters deeply. And if you look back on the history of sales training, it has been very much a horizontally based industry of building acumens. That doesn't go away. What now matters as much or more is vertical development. And on that vertical axis, James and I have just really broken it down into three components. Number one is building cognitive capacity. Yes, your intellect, how you think. It's what we've talked about earlier. Mm. Number two is your character, which I'll come back to in a minute. And then third are your is your mindset, which is the work, Phil, that you've started and that we built on. We kind yeah. of see those as the three building blocks of that vertical axis. Does that make sense so far? I think it's really interesting the way you've, I've heard you talk about this before, but I'm 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 sort of getting very much a visual of this now. You know, in the way that you're talking about this vertical and and horizontal. So just to kind of so at the horizontal level, am I right? If I just summarize what I what what you're describing, we're very much looking at the the sort of base competencies and knowledge and skills, if you like, that you need to have to be able to perform your your role in this case as salespeople. Yeah, the vertical is looking deeper. It's looking beyond that, as you say, to character, to values and mindsets and, and uh, cognitive thinking, which you describe as reflective practice.